So you want to learn to date rocks? That's okay. I'm not here to judge. On the contrary, I will happily guide you through the process, starting with the basics. What you'll discover, I hope, is that geochronology, the use of Earth materials to measure time, is fundamentally a simple and elegant concept, fully accessible to the non-scientist. But it can explode in complexity once we investigate the full range of techniques with all their gory mathematical details. And especially as we discuss the natural events in a rock's life cycle that can undermine the accuracy of those results. Therefore, my goal in this series is to present radiometric dating in four levels of difficulty, from high school to grad student, so that you can decide where to begin and end your study and are guaranteed to learn something new. If at any point you feel lost, please don't hesitate to ask in the comments. Chances are, you aren't the only one. So let's get into it and date some rocks, where it's always appropriate to ask about age. When you visit a landscape like this, it's natural to wonder how old are these rocks? How long did it take for this valley to form? Conveniently, there's bound to be a sign or a guide nearby, ready to tell you, ah yes, this mountain formed between 90 and 100 million years ago. And then a million years ago, it was covered with glaciers. But for the last 10,000 years or so, it looked pretty much like it does today. Well, that's all impressive, of course, but how do you know? I mean, none of us were there, and at least in my experience, rocks aren't that talkative. With a little inquiry, you'll learn that all rocks contain some elements that are radioactive, and these decay at a known rate into different elements. So with some fancy math, you can compare those values today and estimate how long the rock has been decaying, like using an hourglass. At the very least, you should understand that rocks have a specific chemical composition, depending on their age. It sounds easy enough, but this explanation is a little too vague and oversimplified for my taste. So instead, my goal is that by the end of level 1, you'll not only understand how radiometric dating works in principle, but you'll be able to calculate the age of this specific rock from the original lab data using nothing more than the calculator on your phone. The first prerequisite is to understand the difference between elements, ions, and isotopes. Start with the two simplest and most abundant elements in our universe, hydrogen and helium. Elements are distinguished from each other by the number of protons in their nucleus. No matter what, hydrogen will always have one proton and helium will have two. This convention is rooted in the observation that proton count determines the chemical behavior of an atom. It is the reason that hydrogen can bond readily with oxygen to form water, but helium never will. It's also the reason that we arrange the periodic table by number of protons, beginning at hydrogen with one proton and ending naturally at uranium with 92 protons. With this arrangement, elements periodically exhibit similar chemical behavior, categorized by the columns of this table. For any given element, the number of negatively charged electrons tends to be the same as the number of positively charged protons, which balances the atom. If that number differs, then the element becomes an ion, whose net charge is defined by the number of protons minus the number of electrons. I won't dwell on ions because they are more relevant to understanding bonding and reactions between molecules. Except to say that due to their charge, ions respond to magnetic fields. Neutral atoms don't. Remember that point for later. Finally, we get to isotopes, which for any given element are defined by the number of neutrons in the nucleus. Hydrogen always has one proton, but naturally occurs as three isotopes. 1H, which has zero neutrons, 2H, which has one neutron, and 3H, which has two neutrons. You may already have noticed the isotope number, which is also called the atomic mass, is defined as the sum of protons and neutrons. By comparison, helium has two isotopes, 3 helium with one proton and 4 helium with two protons. Are you with me so far? Let's review the naturally occurring isotopes of a few more elements and learn the full conventional notation. Carbon and sulfur have three isotopes each, 12, 13, and 14 for carbon, 32, 33, and 34 for sulfur. Because carbon always has six protons denoted by the lower left subscript, 12 carbon has 12 minus six equals six neutrons denoted by the lower right subscript. 13 carbon has 13 minus six equals seven neutrons. And 14 carbon has 14 minus six equals eight neutrons. Given that sulfur has 16 protons, what are the neutron counts for 32, 33, and 34 S? Before moving on, I want to address a common oversimplification of isotopes. First, we can reason that if elements and their chemical behavior are dependent on the number of protons, and all of an element's isotopes have the same number of protons, therefore, isotopes of a given element will behave identically in terms of chemical interactions. Right? 
While it is true that all the isotopes participate in the same chemical reactions, this does not happen at exactly the same rate. For example, all isotopes of hydrogen form the same bond with oxygen to make water, and therefore would participate in any reaction where water is involved. Let's take the simple evaporation of liquid water to form water vapor. The molecules that contain heavier isotopes of hydrogen, in this case, will evaporate at a slightly slower rate. Not by much, just a few percent, but it is measurable and it can matter to our studies if we need to analyze water for radiometric dating. And yes, that is me foreshadowing a bit. As another example, all isotopes of carbon bond with oxygen to form carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But these molecules do not all have the same mass. A trace amount contain either 13C or 14C, which increases the atomic mass of the molecule. As a result, the diffusion of carbon dioxide into the cell walls of plants, which is needed for photosynthesis, tends to favor molecules with the lighter isotope of carbon. And while almost every introduction to radiometric dating will tell you that the radiocarbon content of plants is the same as the radiocarbon content of the atmosphere, I'm here to inform you that is not the case. Plants always have slightly less 14C than the atmosphere, by a couple of percent. And if you want to measure carbon for, you know, carbon dating, you need to account for this fact. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. We'll have plenty of time to explore this more later after we've learned the methods. So now that you know what isotopes are, let's take a look at how they decay over time. Have you noticed from our examples that the number of neutrons is nearly or the same as the number of protons? That's not a coincidence. Neutrons add mass to the nucleus to balance what are called the strong and weak nuclear forces. If this concept seems counterintuitive, that's probably because we're used to thinking in terms of the electromagnetic force. Opposites attract and like charges repel. You know, like a magnet. And neutrons are, well, neutral in such interactions. That all makes sense until you look at a nucleus, even a stable one which is packed with positively charged protons that we might expect to just fly apart. At incredibly short distances, however, the electromagnetic repulsion is overcome by a much stronger attraction of the strong nuclear force and the exchange of forces driven by the weak nuclear force. Because the nuclear forces act on both protons and neutrons, irrespective of charge, the higher mass of a neutron-packed nucleus adds stability to the configuration, at least to a point. Take another look at these isotopes of hydrogen and carbon, with special attention to the ratio of neutrons to protons. On the left, that ratio is 1 to 1. On the right, it is much higher. If I were to tell you that one of these pairs is radioactive, which would you pick as the most likely candidate? Correct. In both cases, the excess of neutrons makes the nucleus unstable. To correct for this, each of the isotopes undergoes radioactive decay by gaining a proton and losing a neutron. So, tritium becomes 3 helium, and 14 carbon becomes 14 nitrogen. While this sounds like alchemy, it results from the fact that protons and neutrons themselves are made up of smaller elementary particles, whose individual charges can reverse in response to the weak nuclear force. In this particular example, one of the three quarks that compose a neutron reverses charge, releasing a few high-energy particles in the process. The change in quarks turns a neutron into a proton. The particles produced and emitted from the nucleus are an electron and an antineutrino, which we measure as radioactivity. With these concepts in mind, let's take a look at what's called the chart of nuclides, which plots every isotope as a function of neutron and proton counts. The International Atomic Energy Agency provides an interactive version of this chart, which I highly encourage you to try out at the link in the description. Neutrons are on the x-axis and protons are on the y-axis. Black squares denote the stable isotopes, which will never change outside of nuclear reactions. The variously colored squares denote radioactive isotopes. Now you may have noticed I oversimplified a little. That one-to-one -one relationship only really holds for elements lighter than calcium. Beyond that, it takes a progressively higher number of neutrons to stabilize the nucleus. For example, lead-208 is the heaviest stable isotope and needs up to 126 neutrons to balance its 82 protons. This curve formed by the black squares is commonly known as the valley of stability. All other isotopes decay naturally until they reach a black square. If they fall on the right side of the line, they will gain protons and lose neutrons, moving them up and to the left. If they fall on the left side, they will lose protons and gain neutrons, moving them down and to the right. The isotopes in the upper right quadrant are so heavy that they are inherently unstable, regardless of the configuration. Thus, they will lose both neutrons and protons until they reach a black square. At this point, I will only briefly reference the most common modes by which isotopes can decay, so that we can focus on the topic at hand. 
It's not vital to memorize and understand these reactions to learn how to date rocks, and there are already plenty of good resources available. If you're interested, check the description for a link. The main point to remember is this. Beta decay and electron capture convert protons into neutrons, or vice versa. Alpha decay, on the other hand, results in the loss of two protons and two neutrons at once, reducing the total mass of the isotope by four. Alpha decay typically only occurs in the heaviest elements, and you may have noticed the alpha particle is equivalent to the nucleus of a helium atom. So alpha decay in minerals results in the accumulation of helium over time in proportion to how long decay has been occurring. And if you already see where I'm going with this, you're more attentive than the average student. Okay, so we know there are numerous elements with radioactive isotopes, and these isotopes decay until the nucleus is stabilized. But how do we tie this into geology? First, all rocks are radioactive. Not to a worrying degree, you can still wear your fancy jewelry and keep your granite countertops, but every rock has a trace amount of radioactive isotopes. No exceptions. Rocks and minerals have a wide range of chemical composition, which allows us to choose the isotope that works best for our sample. It also allows us to use multiple isotopes and decay pathways to get the age of a single sample. In other words, we can check our age through independent methods, giving us more confidence in the result, when it works, or information about what went wrong. For example, take a look at the feldspar group here. Feldspars are rich in either potassium, sodium, or calcium. This means that they will have a small fraction of either the radioactive isotope of potassium or the radioactive isotope of rubidium, which can substitute chemically in for potassium. Remember, rubidium falls in the same column as potassium on the periodic table. That gives us at least two methods by which to date these minerals. Next, most radioactive decay happens very, very, very slowly, especially when the nucleus is already close to stability. Let's consider uranium, the icon of radioactivity. And imagine you have one milligram of pure sample. Now, one milligram, if you held it in your hand, it doesn't feel like much, but that is equivalent to two and a half million trillion atoms of uranium. Of that number, only 25 atoms on average will decay at any given second, 25. That means that even after several billion years, there is plenty of the original isotope remaining, which we have to measure to estimate the age. That being said, some isotopes decay much faster than others, which makes them suitable to dating much younger samples, on the order of thousands of years old rather than billions. By mastering all of the techniques, we can extend our study to very recent phenomena, like the ice ages, human history, and archaeology. I'll even show you one method used exclusively to date materials younger than your grandparents. That's all for this episode. Next, we'll explore visually how to derive and use the radioactive decay equation for dating. Yes, there's some math involved, but it's the fun kind with pictures, right? Before I go, I will leave you with four statements about radiometric dating. At least one of these is false. Can you guess which? Leave your guesses in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video.